thank you very much for coming out on a beautiful autumn evening. My name is Jay Garfield, and I teach in the philosophy department. And uh, just is an enormous honor and a pleasure to um, introduce Professor Emily McRae to you. I can think of few people I would, I would prefer to introduce. Um, Emily is doing some of the most exciting work in moral psychology and on the uh, interface between Buddhist philosophy and Western philosophy of anybody in the world right now. She's a tremendous translator and interpreter of Tibetan uh, texts, including Tibetan ethical texts, and a real expert in Western moral psychology as well, and a wonderful teacher. But I want to try, what really impresses me about Emily, I mean, a lot of things do, but this is one that I want to share with you, is her enormous intellectual breadth and creativity as revealed by the titles of just some of her recent papers. And I just want to give you a sense of her range and the interlocking interests that inform her work. Um, perspective taking and the flexible mind, Tibetan Buddhist moral psychology and the virtue of open-mindedness. White delusion and avidya, a Buddhist approach to understanding and deconstructing white ignorance in the collection that she edited with George Yancey on Buddhism and whiteness. Love, attention, and equanimity <clears throat> balanced against anger and oppression, a tantric Buddhist perspective. Detachment in Buddhist ethics, apathia, ataraxia, and equanimity juxtaposed with finding a place for Buddhism in the ethics of the future, comments on technology and the virtues. Equanimity in relationships, responding to moral ugliness. Metabolizing anger, equanimity and intimacy. A wonderful set of interlocking interests that bring together some of the most important questions that we can ask in moral psychology and do so in a fascinating cross-cultural way. So please join me in welcoming Emily McRae from the University of New Mexico, a fabulous scholar and a wonderful guest to have. Thank you, Jay. Can everybody hear me? Am I getting picked up? OK. Um, thank you for inviting me. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here in beautiful New England in the fall. Um, and thank you all for coming out. I know this is not the normal time that you come out for a philosophy talk, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, I do just want to share, before I begin, um, I mentioned this to a couple people who I was talking to over dinner, but I, um, I'm struggling a little bit with long COVID, and one of my symptoms is I um, have a little bit of trouble remembering words. So you might see me kind of pause um, and try to think of a word. If you think you know the word I'm thinking of, <laughs> please do, shout it out. I would not consider that to be rude. In fact, I would consider that to be helpful. Um, uh, so if, if that does happen, uh, you know, please, please do. All right, well, I want to um, talk a little bit tonight about um, a project that I've been working on uh, over the past couple of years that's taking shape into a book um, at the moment. And um, what, I'm, what I've been interested in is what I'm calling moral ignorance, which, by which I mean something kind of broad, um, the way that we ignore things that, that uh, matter, morally speaking, and how we do that, how it functions in our moral psychology and in our relationships and also collectively. Um, and the talk today is on, uh, based on the first chapter of that book. And um, in the book, what I do is I try to develop an account of moral ignorance. I draw on some Buddhist accounts, um, particularly a fourth century account of moral ignorance by the South Asian, by the Indian Buddhist uh, philosopher Vasubandhu. And I'll get to his account a little bit at the end. I'm not actually going to give you a lot um, about his account. What I'm going to do instead is, is a little bit different, um, but I hope it works. I'm gonna try to make room for an account like Vasubandhu's. And what I mean by that is when I was researching this topic of moral ignorance, there were kind of three sets of literatures that stood out to me um, as, as being very interesting um, and useful. One, of course, was the one I just mentioned, the uh, South Asian Buddhist accounts of ignorance. 
uh, which sees ignorance as a, as a, a primary source of suffering. Um, then there's the epistemologies of ignorance literature. So some of you might already be familiar with that, but if you're not, this is the literature that talks about collective ignorance. So like white ignorance, for instance, or uh, colonial ignorance, um, the ways that we collectively ignore things for motivated reasons, self-interested reasons. Um, <clears throat> the third literature that I was interested in will also be familiar to those of you who study philosophy, uh, Western philosophy in particular, and that's the literature on moral ignorance that's coming out of analytic phil philosophical ethics that really looks at uh, moral ignorance as something that is either, um, <clears throat> that will either uh, <clears throat> exculpate you from of doing a wrong action, right? Like, I didn't know it was you know, like, I don't know, Alec Baldwin, right? He shot the gun, he didn't know he, it was loaded. Um, that kind of um, discussion. So it's basically uh, within the framework of um, finding out who's to blame for wrong actions. So these are kind of like these disparate literatures that I was reading, and I, and I thought, well, you know, I'm not that interested in the blame question. <laughs> I think I'm gonna just focus and do a Buddhist account of ignorance and take it from there. And I noticed, um, Right away, when I tried to do that, I, I gave a couple talks to the APA, it didn't go that well. And I think the reason <laughs> is because um, blame and assigning blame, blameworthiness, is a really fundamental framework by, um, that, uh, that I think influences a lot of discussions of a lot of ethical topics in Anglo-American and European philosophy. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to try to have a conversation with uh, these different kinds of literatures, um, all of which, by the way, I identify with. I, I should note that. It's, it's not a hostile conversation. I find myself in, in all of them. Um, then I'm going to have to talk about this question of blame. And so that's what I'm going to do today. Um, I, I want to basically make room for an account of good, uh, sorry, an account of moral ignorance that's not really, um, doesn't really need to speak to whether or not we blame people for ignorance or not, um, whether or not we blame people for ignorance. So, for those of you um, who are not familiar, you'll, I guess you'll, you might have to take it up on my word <laughs> that um, it, you know, uh, if you read kind of contemporary analytic um, philosophical, uh, philosophical um, discussions of moral ignorance, mo almost all of them, I mean, I don't think I've yet to find one that wasn't trying to answer the question, when do we blame people for their ignorance? Um, but I think that this is sort of like studying moral knowledge only to find out when it's praiseworthy or something. It's, it's just a very narrow question in a much broader field. And so what I want to um, argue today, tonight, is that uh, there's, been, there's kind of a disciplinary uh, preoccupation with blameworthiness um, in general and blameworthiness for ignorance in particular. And that even though that can be really productive and insightful for talking about moral responsibility, I don't think that it's that productive for understanding what ignorance is. And I'm gonna say why I think that, and then I'm gonna turn a little bit to the Buddhist conceptions of ignorance that I th think might provide a more holistic understanding of what's going on with moral ignorance, and um, kind of conclude there. Um, so, I'm gonna locate a few problems that I see, a few limitations, um, with thinking about, about moral ignorance through a kind of framework of praise and blame. And, but before I do that, I want to just kind of get everybody up to speed because, you know, I, I, when you're working on a book or a project for a long time, you're just, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of feel like um, I'm, I'm sort of in my own head about what, what things are, are obvious and what things aren't. So I wanted to start, even though at the risk of maybe telling you things you already know, I did want to start with a little bit of a discussion about um, where, where I think philosophically this, um, uh, this discussion of, of blameworthiness for ignorance is coming from. And um, that is um, Aristotle. I think his discussion of involuntary actions in the Nicomachean e Ethics in the uh, book three, he argues very, you know, very famously, um, if you studied that text, 
that there is a, a certain kind of ignorance, and he calls it ignorance of the particulars, that makes an action involuntary. And when an action is involuntary, it, it exculpates, right? it, you, you're not blameworthy for it. Um, his examples of this kind of ignorance are things like sharing information you didn't know was a secret, firing a catapult when you meant to only test that it was working, uh, mistaking your son for your enemy, <laughs> you know, everyday stuff like that. Um, stabbing someone when you thought there was a button on the spear, hurting someone when you thought you were only gonna touch him. Um, but you kind of get the idea, right? Like you, there was some relevant fact you didn't know and that excuses you from, from blame. Um, following that, that discussion, I think a pretty intuitive kind of discussion, um, <clears throat> I mean, just summarizing a lot of years, <laughs> thousands of years, I guess, very quickly, I think the main kind of philosophical puzzle that emerged from that, um, that discussion was really about the, the limits and the contours of what we're responsible for knowing as moral agents, right? What, what ought you know and, and what are you um, excused from not knowing? So, you know, Aristotle notes that we don't typically bar, uh, pardon people who are ignorant of universals, right? If you said, well, I just didn't know that murder was wrong, right? That doesn't strike us as a very good excuse. Um, Aquinas also, you know, notes that um, we're, we don't excuse ignorance of customs, ignorance of laws. But, so not all ignorance is pardonable. You can't get out of every wrong action by, by claiming ignorance. But nevertheless, it does seem like there's a whole bunch of things that we, we aren't responsible for knowing. And so there does seem to be pardonable ignorance. And then the question that kind of emerged, and I think still really animates the discussion in Anglo-European philosophy, is kind of, well, what is the scope of that? What are we really responsible for knowing and what are, are we excused for not knowing? And I think we see in the contemporary um, <clears throat> literature um, in, in philosophical ethics, Anglo-American particularly philosophical ethics, we see kind of a range of positions. Some people say, well, you're, there's very little you're responsible for knowing. Some people say, actually, there's a lot you're responsible for knowing. Then there's a lot of intermediate positions. But what all the accounts, at least that I could, that I found, um, and I read through a lot, what they all share is the common understanding that the motivating question of inquiries into moral ignorance is when is ignorance blameworthy and when are we off the hook uh, due to our ignorance. And the premise of my paper here tonight is, is just to really suggest and hopefully show um, that there's a lot more to say about the morality of ignorance beyond whether we can be blamed for it or, ex or whether it excuses. And if we only attend to this question of blame and excuse, it really limits what um, our understanding of ignorance is and what it can be. Um, and so what I'm gonna do for the main chunk of this paper is to hopefully show you why I think that. Okay. Um, so the I'm gonna go through some problems. Um, I mean, problems is even itself is, is, is like not quite the right word. It's some limitations, I guess. Because I, I guess I should say off the bat, what, what I'm not trying to do here is say that, that inquiry, that Aristotle's inquiry and the inquiries that follow it are really wrong-headed and no one should ever, should ever think about when ignorance exculpates. I'm definitely not saying that. But what I'm trying, going to try to show is that that framework limits us in certain ways that I think are important. So maybe I should call them limitations. So one limitation that comes up um, in this literature on um, moral ignorance coming out of the um, Anglo-American uh, tradition is that it tends to underdefine or under-theorize what ignorance is. And one of the striking things that I noticed um, in many contemporary accounts of moral ignorance is the tendency to not even give a definition of what moral ignorance is. And um, that stands out because, you know, we're philosophers, we like definitions. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of surprised uh, to see that. And, but I think it actually makes sense because if the real question, even in papers that are titled moral ignorance or whatever, if the real question is actually moral responsibility for ignorance, then you have a lot more to say and define about moral responsibility than you do about ignorance. 
Um, there are some accounts that kind of gloss, um, give a gloss of what ignorance is. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on, on some of those um, to give you a sense of sort of what the options are. Um, some um, philosophers have, have given a kind of, or either assume or sort of gloss of in ignorance, I wouldn't even say it's exactly a definition, as some sort of absence or lack of a true belief about morality. So when someone is, has moral ignorance, it's because they have an absence of a true belief about morality. So like Alex Guerrero says this and others, or some version of this, a lack of, of moral knowledge or a lack of realization um, is another way of putting it. Michael Zimmerman, um, who wrote, has written a lot about moral ignorance or moral responsibility for ignorance, has um, defined ignorance as um, a failure to know the truth by way of a failure to believe the truth. Um, some more recent accounts, that was from 1997, some more recent accounts um, in, in 2019, 2020, which is kind of interesting when you think about what's going on in 2020, um, but some of these accounts um, uh, seem to imply that moral ignorance is or includes maybe believing a false moral theory. So it's not that you have like an absence of a moral belief, but you believe something that's false about morality. Um, then there's a kind of maybe virtue, more virtue ethics -y kind of way of putting it. Like for instance, Julia Driver's um, really nice and famous um, essay about the virtues of ignorance. Um, she often uses the phrase acting unknowingly. Like if you do, do something in ignorance, you're acting unknowingly. Um, that is apparently without the relevant moral knowledge. Um, so you can see that actually there's like a lot of different ways of understanding ignorance that are coming through these, um, this uh, literature that, that appears to be all trying to answer the same question, but they're operating with actually pretty different understandings of what ignorance is. Um, and that's fine, of course. Um, but if we really, what I'm interested in doing, I guess, is trying to, to develop like a theory of moral ignorance. Like, try to, to not just define it, but really understand how it works, how it's created, how it's maintained, how it could be addressed or remediated. And if we're interested in those kinds of questions, then these beginnings of definitions aren't really enough. They're not really robust enough to answer questions about what the nature of moral ignorance is or what the function of moral ignorance is. Um, so for example, um, if, we, if we look at this, um, this suggestion, that's I think very a common uh, conception, intuitive conception of ignorance. It's one that, that Buddhists also consider, but, but end up rejecting. Um, this, this idea that moral ignorance is the absence of true belief about morality. Um, okay, um, but if we want to sort of develop that into more fully formed um, account of moral ignorance, it's, it's gonna require a significant amount of work, I think. So for instance, um, certain questions arise uh, when we think about moral ignorance as an absence. One of those questions is, well, how do you come to have an absence of a true belief about morality? A lot of moral beliefs are fairly widely known, actually, <laughs> compared to other types of beliefs, I guess. Um, they're taught to early um, and taught widely, and yet we can ignore them. Right, so for instance, cheating is wrong or something. Um, probably most of us have that belief. Um, and yet, it is possible that in certain contexts, um, or there are certain times or under certain conditions, we might really effectively ignore that belief. Um, so that's a little bit tricky, right? Like how, uh, how would you explain how ignorance is kind of function functioning um, especially ignorance about morality if it's just an absence. Also, um, a question that kind of immediately arises is like how is an absence of true belief corrected? Um, it, seems, it, it seems to be implied by the word absence that if we want to correct ignorance, if we're interested in remediating in ignorance, that would be remediated by kind of filling up an epistemic gap, right? Like we don't know this thing, that's what ignorance is, so we need to come to, to know it. But I think especially with moral ignorance, as opposed to maybe other kinds of ignorance, that doesn't always work, 
exposure to moral knowledge doesn't necessarily um, actually correct the ignorance. Um, you know, if I, for instance, were walking in Northampton and I wanted a cup of coffee and I didn't know where to get one and I asked someone and they told me, well, you might say I had an absence of, of knowledge and it was kind of filled by somebody um, telling me where a good cafe is. But with moral objects, <laughs> um, I think it's very common that we actually kind of dig in our heels. Um, and we see that, I think, a lot in, in the m really moralized and polarized discussions of um, various you know, morally important topics, climate crisis, for instance, racism, um, immigration, um, where we don't seem to be getting anywhere through the exposure. <laughs> well, maybe that's exaggeration. We don't seem to be getting very far with exposing people to knowledge. Um, anyway, we can, I can say more about that later. But that's like another you know, immediate question that, that comes up. Um, We might also want to think about, well, what's the difference between having, between an absence of a true belief and the presence of a false belief? Um, how do they function differently in our, in our psychologies? Do they tend to be about different things? Um, if, if ignorance is an absence of, of um, true belief about morality, how do we explain all those mechanisms of ignorance that, for instance, feminists and critical race theorists have been so, um, um, successful in bringing our attention to things like convenient forgetting, epistemic avoidance, um, trivializing something, rationalizing something, distracting ourselves with something. Those are mechanisms of ignorance, but they don't seem to be about not having a belief. So, this is all to say, <laughs> uh, these are not, this is not supposed to be like a reductio exactly of, of an absence view of ignorance, although I don't think that that view is right, but more just to say that um, there's a lot more that we can say uh, and we think we need to say about ignorance um, than really what we're getting from a literature that's, that's focusing on moral responsibility. And it's not just the absence view. I mean, we could ask a bunch of questions about the other views as well, like if we, if we kind of prefer that Aristotelian kind of um, locution of um, acting unknowingly. There's a whole bunch of questions there too. Why is ignorance def defined in terms of action, right? There's no reason that has to be the case. Um, what's the difference between acting un unknowingly and um, learning something? <laughs> so if we're learning something, is, does that mean we're an ignorant, like what is the, what is the uh, connection there? How does un unknowing action how is it remediated? Um, and I think that some of these questions have gotten a little bit of attention um, recently, but my point really is just this, that um, the nature of moral ignorance, I think, is really under-theorized in the contemporary Anglo-American literature, and, the, and not only that, but the under-theorization is actually explained by the preoccupation with blame and uh, with that question, that that kind of explains why um, why we're, we're not really getting any, anything like a full account of what moral ignorance is or uh, what it does. There's a kind of a second part uh, to the under-theorization problem that has to do with the object of ignorance. So um, one of the things, I think the basic things if we talk about moral ignorance is that we should be, be able to explain what it is and what it's about. I think that that's that's uh, fair, <laughs> fair questions. Um, I just tried to argue uh, that there's not really a lot to go on in terms of what ignorance is, what moral ignorance is. Um, what it's about is um, we get a little bit more coming out of um, this, this literature, um, and presumably because there's this need, although not in Buddhist philosophy, but I think in philosophies coming out of Europe, to be able to explain the difference between ignorance broadly, or I don't know, yeah, well, yes, we can just say ignorance and moral ignorance. And usually the distinction is, is really about what it, what it is about. Like moral ignorance is about something moral, <laughs> about something moralized, um, whereas other kinds of ignorance aren't. And so there is um, some discussion about what kind of, or, or what moral ignorance is about. And I would say that the, um, the consensus there 
as far as I uh, have been able to find, is that moral ignorance is about wrongness. It's about what makes an action wrong. Um, Michael Zimmerman, who I quoted before, says, uh, defines moral ignorance as the ignorance of the fact that one's behavior is morally wrong. Gideon Rosen um, also kind of uh, has a view like that, that it's ignorance of every wrong-making feature of your action. Um, and a lot of people accept that, that the object of moral ignorance is about wrong action. That's what, if you're, that's what you're confused about if you're confused about morality. And often it's your own wrong action, but I guess you could also say maybe moral ignorance is about wrong action generally. Um, that kind of object makes a lot of sense if we're trying to figure out when we blame people and when we excuse people. Because we blame people for things they do wrong, right? So if we want to, dis dis if we want to understand when we should blame someone, it makes sense to look at actions that are wrong. Um, and so in, in a way, it makes sense that a definition would, could arise from moral ignorance in this framework as ignorance of, of the wrongness of actions. Um, but I think that defining ignorance in this way is, is overly narrow. It produces an overly narrow understanding of moral ignorance. And that's because we can be ignorant about features of the moral world that aren't about the wrongness of an action. So we could, for instance, be confused whether just to, I'm just kind of borrowing ethical language here that you could reject or, or not, but we could uh, be confused about whether an action is supererogatory or required, right? Like whether it goes beyond uh, the call of duty to do this or whether it's just your duty uh, to do this thing. We could be confused about whether something's virtuous or, or just kind of decent, um, common courtesy. We could be confused about the moral efficacy of an action we could be confused about our own moral skill set. Um, I mean, Julia Driver, for instance, under, uh, understands modesty as being ignorant of, of your, some of your good qualities. <laughs> um, so that's not a, a wrong action, right? That's um, not a um, ignorance about a wrong action. We could be um, ignorant about something that's totally unrelated to action. For instance, um, there could be moral ignorance about how we're narrating our own lives or mentally orienting towards someone. So Iris Murdoch uh, has a very famous example of this. Some of you probably know about um, a mother-in-law who's trying to reorient her perspective about her daughter-in-law um, because her old, uh, her old perspective was very snobby. Um, this is, doesn't seem to be about action. Um, but it does seem to be a case of moral ignorance. And I don't think that this is really surprising once we kind of let go of the blame and praise and excuse framework. Um, because, yeah, I think most of us will probably admit there's more to morality than the wrongness of actions. And so there's more to be confused about um, than being confused about what makes an action wrong. Um, and I think that this broader ignorance is still moral ignorance. But it's the kind of moral ignorance that's really... Um, ignored <laughs> uh, <laughs> when, we're, when we're focusing on, on blame, because blame gets us to think about wrong actions. Um, so that's kind of the limit, the first limitation, that there's certain kind of under-theorization that, um, that happens um, within this framework. The other thing I want to mention, the other kind of limitation um, has to do with certain kinds of distinctions that come up between kinds of ignorance, kind, different kinds of moral ignorance um, in the moral responsibility literature. So for instance, one of the main distinctions is between factual ignorance and moral ignorance proper. Right? So I could be confused, um, I could be ignorant of the fact that um, this, okay, I have no good example here. <laughs> I, could, I could, okay, here's Jay's hat. I could be confused that this hat is Jay's hat. I could think it's my hat. Um, and so I might walk out with it, and, I, and then I've done something wrong, and I've done it from factual ignorance because it's not my hat. I have a really similar hat at home, but it's not my hat. It's Jay's hat. Um, the, whereas moral ignorance 
is about um, ignorance about the rights and wrongs themselves, right? That it's wrong to take someone's hat. Um, it's, if, I, if I think it's right to take someone's hat or something, then that would be an example of moral ignorance. This is a very big distinction um, that we see in this literature. Other distinctions that might be familiar to some of you is like ignorance versus acrasia, um, culpable versus non-culpable ignorance. All of these, these distinctions are really helpful when we're trying to sort out who's to blame and when. They're not so helpful when we're trying to understand how ignor moral ignorance works and what it does and how to remediate it. And one, to give you one example, um, the factual and moral ignorance distinction, which seemed, I hope, fairly clear in the example with Jay's hat, um, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense if we're trying to figure out whether or not I'm to blame for taking Jay's hat back to Albuquerque with me. Um, if it's factual ignorance, he can probably forgive me. If it's moral ignorance, maybe not. But um, when we're trying to understand why I would do such a thing, right? If we're trying to understand how it works in my psychology, this, this distinction can actually, although conceptually really clear, can, can be, although it conceptually clear, um, it, it can kind of mystify those questions. Um, and that's because moral ignorance and factual ignorance are informing each other all the time. Um, right, they're, they're, um, it's almost hard to disentangle them. It's easy to do it conceptually, but it, it's hard to do it in any particular case. And this is a point that I think has been really well made by feminists, critical race theorists, um, people who do epistemology of, of ignorance, that um, factual ignorance is, um, is kind of both the consequence of moral ignorance and it's what allows moral ignorance to keep going. So, for instance, um, I think Charles Mills um, has the, maybe the, the best discussion of this that I've been able to, to find. Um, he argues that collective moral ignorance makes it difficult to recognize, attend to, and remember fac facts of a situation and makes it more likely that those facts will be distorted or reimagined in, more, uh, in ways that are more in line with the assumptions underpinning uh, the collective misunderstanding. So what facts we are e even can be accessible to us, what we even perceive, what we remember, and when we remember it, um, those are uh, even just about facts, right, are conditioned by moral ignorance. He gives a really great um, example from Melville's novella, The Nita Serino, and he, I'll just read to you what he says, um, but, but basically the premise here is that the, the protagonist, um, Delano, I think is his name, um, can't, can't kind of see the facts of a slave rebellion on a ship, even though it's becoming increasingly obvious. And this is what, um, how Mills uh, describes, describes the situation. Boarding a slave ship, the San Dominic, a reference to the Haitian Revolution, which unknown to the protagonist, Amos Delano, has been taken over by its human cargo. The white crew being held, with the white crew being held hostage, Delano has all around him the evidence for black insurrection from the terror in the eyes of the nominal white captain as his black barber puts a razor to his throat to the Africans clashing their hatchets, hatchets ominously in the background. But so unthinkable is the idea that the inferior blacks could have accomplished such a thing that Delano searches for every possible alternative explanation for the seemingly strange behavior of the imprisoned whites, no matter how far-fetched. And this, um, this misrepresentation of the facts, right, is only possible in the context of, of the moral ignorance. Right? That kind of thing, right, it, it, there wouldn't be the conditions for reinterpreting the facts that way without the moral ignorance. So although we can make that conceptual distinction, I think if we want to understand how moral ignorance works, we, um, we have to kind of understand them as actually being really entangled um, and supporting each other. Because once we reinterpret those, those facts um, in a way that's kind of keeping alive our, our moral ignorance, well then that just becomes further evidence for the moral ignorance, right? So it's not just that the moral ignorance produces these reinterpretation of facts, but then the reinterpretation of facts then helps to sustain the moral ignorance. So they're very much um, in interdependent features. And I think the only reason that um, we like to separate them so much is in service of answering the question of, about blame. Um, 
which again is fine. <laughs> it's a fine distinction to make if that's what you're interested in. Um, but I think it's just helpful to, to note because it's such a taken for granted distinction that it can actually, I think, be a little bit misleading um, when we're trying to think about how, more, how ignorance is functioning. Okay, um, I wanna go to the third, um, the third issue here. I know in my, in, my, in my title I said a Buddhist approach to moral ignorance, which I'm not gonna get to till the very end, so if you're here for that, I apologize. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's, a, there's like a lot of setup to this one. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through. Um, so I, I wanna move to another, another issue here. Um, and that is, um, actually, Susan and I were kind of talking about this over dinner, that I think when we're focused on blameworthiness, um, like whether ignorance is to be blamed or, or it, whether it can excuse, it's easy to ignore uh, cases that, you know, a problem of, of moral ignorance that um, aren't blameworthy. Um, but I think that those exist. I think there are cases of moral ignorance that aren't blameworthy, and some of the cases that I, that I just gave before, if you remember, um, I think those are cases like that, like, do I, is it supererogatory or is it right, um, for instance, is, um, I don't know if we would be blamed for making a mistake on, on one of those. Um, but there's other kinds of examples of moral ignorance that's not blameworthy um, as well. Um, and so here I don't mean like factual ignorance, like I took Jay's hat by mistake. That, that everybody agrees that's not blameworthy um, in most cases. But I'm talking about actual like moral ignorance, like having you know, some, some wrong beliefs somewhere um, <clears throat> and, and other things wrong emotions, wrong motivations uh, that aren't blameworthy. And so one example that I've been interested in lately um, is first person moral assessments. So the way that we, we judge morally or assess ourselves. And it, I think it's not uncommon, you may know people like this, um, for people to treat themselves overly harshly um, maybe even have harsher judgments about themselves than they do about other people. Um, they hold themselves maybe to a higher standard, so to speak, than they might um, with other people. So maybe um, they're very perfectionistic, or, um, or maybe even in a, a case of a very like enthusiastic caregiver, right, who kind of believes at some level that other people's care is more important than than her, than her own or his own or their own uh, care. Um, we typically don't find those people blameworthy, I don't think, but their actions, their perspectives are informed by a kind of ignorance that I think is morally problematic. We would worry for them. Um, we do, I think, worry for them um, when, when we're in those situations. So in this kind of case, I mean, you could, I guess you could say that um, because those cases aren't blameworthy, then they're not wrong or there's nothing morally problematic about them. I don't find that very convincing um, because I think there's really har there's very real harms, that moral harms that can come out of habits of really harsh self-judgment, boundaryless caregiving, you know, including the disrespect to self, not properly recognizing the worth of the self, habituating oneself to harsh self-punishment, making oneself vulnerable to certain kinds of abuse, perhaps, of others, um, not to mention, right, the ways in which that, that having a relationship to yourself in that way may negatively affect others, like, you know, children, for instance, who internalize that way of relating. So I think it's actually a big problem <laughs> when um, people, mm, when we, um, treat ourselves, even if we're not treating others, treat ourselves wrongly out of, or badly, I guess we could say, out of ignorance. So I don't think we can say just because we don't blame those people, they're not doing anything wrong. Although there are people who do say that, so maybe it is convincing to, to some people, yeah. Um, but to me, I don't, I don't find that line so, so convincing. Um, another, another way you could go is you could say, well, if they're really doing something morally problematic with their harsh self-judgment or their boundaryless caregiving or something like that, then they really are blameworthy. 
Um, but I don't find that very compelling either because um, I, don't, I think that's really at odds with our practices around issuing blame. Um, we don't usually blame people, for example, for giving too much of themselves. I don't think like blaming someone for excessively negative self-talk would be a very attractive option <laughs> um, <laughs> to most people. And that's because blame isn't just an attitude, it's also a social practice. So we have, you know, uh, I think that, that none of, neither of those options work, and I think we're kind of left with the possibility that somebody could be acting in a morally problematic way from ignorance, and they're just not blameworthy. Um, and um, I think this shows that there's, there are cases, and I haven't thought about it that much, actually. I mean, if anybody has other cases in, that are springing to mind, I'd love to hear them, but I guess I have a hunch that there are a fair amount of cases um, in which the application of blame or excuse is just awkward and unhelpful, it just doesn't apply, and it's not, um, it doesn't clarify anything. <laughs> it doesn't help you understand what's going on. I think the fact that therapists, <laughs> I mean like, if you've ever been to couples counseling, I mean, not from experience, um, but, <laughs> um, you know, the last thing the therapist is going to say is like, you know, I really just want to get straight about who's to blame, <laughs> right? Like, is it you or is it you? Like, let, let's just be really clear about that. Um, and then we can move on, right? Um, there are cases, and I'm not saying blame's a useless concept or anything like that, but there, I think there are like a, a fair amount of cases where it, that's just not not helping, it's just not, it's, it's a kind of awkward insistence on making a kind of judgment that isn't particularly helpful in understanding how, how things happen, how things come together. So, so that's another problem that I've, I'm finding um, in the literature, and it really, I mean, it's kind of like the approach to ethics, I guess, um, that's the, the larger background question. Uh, uh, the approach to moral ignorance in particular that is really blame-centric is that it, it kind of puts our blinders on to all the ways in which determining blame um, may just not be relevant or may not be helpful and may not be what we want to do. Um, <clears throat> all right, the final limitation, and this is finally getting us into Buddhism, um, thank you for your patience if you've been waiting for that, <laughs> is that other frameworks for understanding moral ignorance do exist. And um, that's a happy, uh, a happy fact, um, but they mostly exist outside of the contemporary Anglo-European philosophical literature. Um, I mean, the exception, the main exception, of course, is the epistemologies of literature, the feminist critical race li uh, literature that is centered, I think, um, in, in American and European and North American philosophies too. Um, but those are really looking at collective ignorances. Um, not ignorance in, in any other context. But there are um, traditions um, that have a lot to say about ignorance, both collective and on an individual level, and what it is and how it arises. Um, <clears throat> and one of the problems with blame-centric approaches to ethics more generally, in my experience, I guess, as someone who's been working comparative ethics for a while, is that it, it really, um, shrinks the pool of possible interlocutors because a lot of ethical traditions aren't centered in determining blame. And um, when we think that that's like the kind of ultimate question that we should be answering, that's, the, that's what all of our concepts are in service of, then we won't get very far in a philosophical dialogue with um, ethics that are not trying to answer that question. And there's a lot of ethics that, that aren't that concerned with that question or only peripherally concerned with that question. Um, one of the interlocutors I mentioned in the beginning who I particularly like is the fourth century um, Indian Buddhist philosopher Vasubandhu, and he gives a really, really interesting account of ignorance. Um, but it's, it's situated in um, a philosophical context that's pretty far removed from from evaluating blameworthiness or praise or excuse. What he's interested in instead is understanding the psychology of, of ignorance, um, of avidya, um, which I'm translating here as, as ignorance, but it's a kind of moralized ignorance. I'll get to why in a minute. Um, he's trying to understand how that ignorance functions in our psychology, in our inter, um, 
um, in our interpersonal relationships and um, also in some ways kind of collectively. He does actually talk about that um, as well a little bit. Um, <clears throat> So I hope that by going through all those limitations of blame-centric approaches that we're all really primed to hear this, <laughs> this account of um, moral ignorance um, without the immediate knee-jerk reaction, yeah, but how, is, the, is the ignorance culpable? Um, so on Fosse Bonge's account, he, um, he's really interested in um, really two main points about ignorance, what it causes, what it can do, its function, and um, what it is. And by what it is, I think he means how it's related to other things. Like how is it related to emotion? How is it related to desire? How is it related to even perception, uh, attention, those kinds of things. Um, and his analysis of ignorance speaks really kind of shockingly directly to the definitional problems that I, I um, posed in the beginning of the paper, he considers three main candidates for defining ignorance. Ignorance is the negation of knowledge, um, which is somewhat similar, I think, to this idea of acting unknowingly, like unknowingness or something as ignorance. Um, ignorance as the absence of knowledge, which we talked about, and ignorance as an opposition to knowledge. These are kind of roughly, honestly, I think shockingly similar to the, the terrain that comes out of um, contemporary literature on ignorance, that it's an absence, it's an unknowingness, or it's a failure. Those are basically Vasubandhu's um, uh, uh, options. And um, he, he argues against ignorance as a negation of knowledge because he thinks that um, there's a lot of things that aren't knowledge, but they're not ignorance either. His example is like the eyeball. Uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, he also thinks that ignorance as an absence doesn't make a lot of sense. Like you could say, oh, it, you know, ignorance is the absence of knowledge, but um, he says, well, ignorance is a lot more active than that. It causes things, it does things. How do you explain how ignorance is causing, and of course in the Buddhist context, it's like causing suffering um, through a variety of means. Um, how do we understand how ignorance is acting, what it's doing? Um, when we think of it as an absence. He thinks that it's, not, it's just it's not very well suited to a, a description of, of ignorance. So instead, he argues um, that, that ignorance is an opposition to moral knowledge, that, that, when, that ignorance is actually an activity. It's something that we do. It's not something we are, and it's not something that just happens to us. It's something that we do um, that obscures kind of our access to knowledge to moral, you know, morally important knowledge um, through a variety of mechanisms that I probably don't have time to talk, oh my God, I don't have time to talk about. Okay, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, I'm gonna stop, I'm gonna, really, I'm gonna stop. So um, anyway, um, please feel free, you know, in the Q&A to, to ask me more about his view. But one of the things that that is really attracted to me about his view is that it does tell us what, what, or at least initially, you know, it gives us something to go on in terms of what ignorance is, how it functions, how it's created, how it's maintained, what we might be able to do about it, um, and how it's related to other things. We think of ignorance, I think that the default is in English is to think of ignorance as like an epistemic or cognitive kind of thing, um, and knowledge is an epistemic or cognitive kind of thing, but not so for, for Vasubandhu. He's not just talking about um, not... Um, not having a specific belief. He's talking about the ways um, that um, the, um, the kind of activity of making those beliefs, uh, true beliefs, inaccessible to us. And in fact, he does say that ignorance isn't equivalent to a false belief, it's what generates a false belief. So he has a view on that too. He also has a view on the object of ignorance. Um, which really has to do with the nature of identity, the nature of relationality, and um, the nature of suffering. I can talk about that more later if anyone's interested. And of course, Vasu Bandhu isn't the only interlocutor. There's a lot of good <laughs> accounts of moral ignorance coming out of um, uh, non-Western philosophies. Um, Patanjali has a really interesting um, one, for instance, but for a story for another day. Um, Okay, I want to conclude by 
giving an account of what I think of an account of moral ignorance should be able to do and what I think that the, the sort of um, proto-definitions that we're getting from the moral responsibility literature aren't doing. So I think a good account of moral ignorance should be able to, as I mentioned, explain what it is and what it's about. Um, it should be able to explain the phenomenology of moral ignorance. How does moral ignorance feel? How, does, uh, it, how is it related to our emotions? Like fear and ignorance, like those go together, seem like pretty close, right? But um, how, right, and why? Um, I think explaining the, the harms or even possible benefits in certain cases um, of moral ignorance um, is something a, a theory of moral ignorance should be able to do. It should also be, uh, we should also be able to um, understand how ignorance forms. What are the conditions that produce ignorance and how is it maintained? Because one of the things about ignorance that's really w weird, I guess, is that you do have to maintain it because it's in face, in, in, in violation of, of the reality in a certain way. Um, and sometimes it can be really hard to maintain it and you have to get other people to help you maintain it. Um, like Jeff and I were talking actually about this uh, dinner of family dynamics, for instance, where the, the family is all kind of colluding in a way to, to sort of um, um, keep a, a, an ignorance going, right? Like we're not gonna talk about that or that never happened, that isn't, like it isn't that way. Um, that takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of, um, people sometimes to keep that going. We should also be able to explain, I think, the tenacity of moral ignorance. I mentioned that in the beginning. Why is it harder than other kinds of ignorance to correct? Right, it seems like it's harder, but um, like, you know, QAnon, for instance, is a really good example of that. So why is it harder to, to correct that than not knowing the, you know, capital of Montana or something? That should be, we should be able to explain that. Um, why is it kind of evasive in self-reflection? Like it's easier to see someone else's ignorance than your own ignorance. Why? It's not always easier to see someone else's jealousy than your own jealousy. So, I mean, maybe sometimes it is, but not always. But ignorance seems to be very murky to the self. Um, ignorance also comes in a lot of forms. I talked about like distraction, convenient forgetting, strategic ignoring, epistemic avoidance, denial, you know, all of the delusion, confusion. Um, an account should be able to explain how those things are related, if they are related or if they're different, different things. Um, and finally, I think that um, a good account of moral ignorance should be able to offer practical guidance about how it is that we, um, what we might do about ignorance at an individual or collective level. Um, and I think, I haven't shown this at all, but I think that um, Basubandu's account, this Buddhist account that I'm, that I'm drawing on in, in my book, may be able to do at least uh, most of those things. Um, but I'll stop there and thank you all for your attention. Before I open the floor for questions, and questions will require the microphone because we're ignoring, because we're uh, broadcasting and uh, recording this, so I'll have to run around and, and do that. I also wanted to say that um, Emily is going to be offering a philosophy over pizza tomorrow at 12.15 in Dewey House Common Room, talking about confusion and ignorance. So she'll be spreading confusion and ignorance for quite a while, <laughs> and, um, and people are welcome to come to that. Whoever said there was no free lunch? Um, and plenty of confusion. Um, so we're going to follow um, Australian rules in the, in, in the discussion. That means if you've got a new line of questioning, raise your hand. If you have a follow-up question on the current line, raise your finger, and fingers will always have preference over hands so we can keep discussion coherent and students have preference over faculty members. So the floor is now open. Yes. Hello, thank you so much. I am a student of Patanjali. I study mm -hmm. the Yoga Sutra, so I'm really curious. Is it the Yoga Sutras that's a source of th that I should look more closely at? Is there a particular sutra, a chapter and sutra that uh, you're you're speaking of? That yes, um, it is the Yoga Sutras. I don't remember um, specifically the the um, the sutra. 
Um, Mansala has a has an article about it. Um, if you, at which if you emailed me, I could send you that. Um, but it's it's basically yeah, trying to understand in in Sanskrit, it's avidya, where vidya is knowledge, or pure knowledge, or something like that, clear knowledge. And so, um, the um, the discussion is kind of like trying to understand what the ah is doing. Like, is it negating it? Is it opposing it? Is it saying it's bad knowledge? Is it yeah, that, that was the, the reference, yeah. But you could email me, and I, and I could, yeah, send it to you. Who's next? Yes, Vicki. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, bringing to our attention our ignorance of ignorance. <laughs> I really appreciate it. This is on a slightly different topic, a slightly, but closely related, and that is the conditions under which we hope for other people's ignorance. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily of our, uh, our own ignorance of others, but others' ignorance of us. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty quite common. It's particularly common when we reflect on uh, the amount of surveillance that is done on us by this, that, and the other party. And mm -hmm. I learned recently that Mm, within the last century, the Spanish people produced, in behalf of many of it, got some of their uh, legal people to produce something called the right to be forgotten, mm -hmm. which then apparently got folded into the EU law about that, where people were so alarmed by how much others were able to know about them without yeah. their knowing that they know it. They just find out in the worst ways. Right. So I wonder if among the many attitudes you might want to <laughs> talk and, uh, about in your 10-volume uh, book, <laughs> which I'm really looking forward to, would be the di desire to be ignored. Mm -hmm. And in fact, building up various routines to be ignored, for, yeah. for better or for worse. Yeah. You know, partly because we think that, in many cases, that people are acting immorally towards us. Mm -hmm. And they're using their knowledge of us to do that, so we hope to block their knowledge. So, yeah. thanks. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Did you read um, Ferrante's My Brilliant Friend? My Brilliant Friend, it's a novel. Uh, it's, but it starts with that, that she, the main character wants to be forgotten and, and feels like she has a right to, to be forgotten. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't really thought about like privacy basically um, that, that much. What initially comes to mind is, you know, a lot of that I guess would probably be considered ign like factual ignorance, you know, in, in this, in this um, way of thinking about it that um, is... Um, yeah, uh, it's, I don't think um, even people who argue that we should remediate ignorance think that we should remediate the moral ignorance and not necessarily the factual, right? So I don't have a, like a right to know every fact about you. Um, in in the, the Buddhists do it, so that would be like one way maybe you could, you could say, um, you could respond to that, that um, even if you think that we should be trying to even if you think we should be trying to eliminate ignorance, which, I mean, I don't know like what, if that's even possible or desirable, you could still say it's only a certain kind of ignorance that we're trying to eliminate, not the ignorance of you know, what you ate for breakfast and what your social security number is and all of that. On the Buddhist view, they don't really make that factual versus moral ignorance. What they say is that um, you know, basically the, the ignorance that we should try to to address is the ignorance that causes suffering. Um, and my ignorance of your social security number is not causing suffering and probably, is probably causing happiness, right? Um, so um, that would be like another way, you know, you could go with that question. Um, but, but your, your uh, question also made me think about the ways that we want to be ignored in maybe less healthy ways too. Like that, that can also come up, right? We maybe we don't want to be seen or known for some for some reason. I mean, not because we're like hiding from the law or something. I mean, maybe that could be one, but also maybe just out of habit, you know, uh, 
wallflower or something, I don't want you to notice me or something, that may actually be causing suffering for you. So in that kind of case, the Buddhist might say, well, then, yeah, there's something that needs to be addressed there. I don't, <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know if I, if I really scratch the surface, but that's what came to mind. Thank you. <laughs> Something I'm curious about um, in your discussion of culpability and ignorance um, is the role of language in our ideas of when someone is culpable. Mm -hmm. I watched a TED talk recently um, talking about how the English language in particular is very quick to assign blame just in our oh. sentence structure where um, we're always saying like, so-and-so knocked the vase over, yeah. <laughs> so-and-so broke his arm, whereas in Spanish, that might not be the case. It might be that the base was knocked over yes. or um, an arm was broken. Right. And I'm just curious about um, in the languages that you've studied in Tibetan or Sanskrit manuscripts, what you've noticed around the language of culpability. Yeah, that is such an interesting question. I'd love to see that talk if you remember who it was. Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, because I think, right, I mean, you'll even get corrected in English, right? You'd get to take it out of the passive voice. <laughs> right? You've got to put it in the active voice. Who did what to whom? Um, I think, yeah, in Tibetan, I mean, Jay, you could um, weigh into this. I think that, um, that yeah, there's less, um, there, there's maybe less than English um, emphasis um, on, on um, like, for instance, there's verbs that are, in Tibetan, you can have intentional versus unintentional verbs, right? So they have a totally different word for when you're doing something unintentionally. Um, and, and then you would also use a different, ver like, verb ending for that um, to mark that you are doing, that you didn't intend to do that. But and, do, a different case. and a different case. Right, right. Yeah, so that's, I hadn't thought about that, but that's a really interesting point. Right, so there may be something in, in our... English language that um, that m makes us more likely to think in those ways. Yeah. So a follow-up question that I have mm -hmm. is, um, I'm curious about what you said about how sometimes it can be really helpful to be differentiating between um, kinds of ignorance that someone should be culpable for or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm curious, I'm wondering if what the cases would be in which it actually would be helpful to blame someone for something as opposed to just responding um, yeah. to the need for some kind of remediation. Right, yeah. And I guess that's a really good question. Um, and I think it depends a lot on how you're thinking about what blame consists in. Um, I was trying to be like as gentle as I could to, I guess, what I consider like a real myopic focus on blame in, that I see in philosophy. So, but you're asking the question on the other side, right? It's like, well, what, what's the point of even like having that? Um, and I mean, I think the more, the older that I get, I guess, and the more that I think about it, I think that there's less and less um, um, situations where blame is the, really that helpful. Um, but you could say, um, if you mean by blame you're, that you're trying to figure out who did the thing so that you can figure out who is responsible for the reparations of that thing, right? Like, I was the one who broke your vase, so I'm the one who buys you a new one. You know, that's helpful, um, conventionally, right, to, to do that. Um, but, and, and of course, in the legal system, right, that comes up. But I actually think, and this is not, this is part of just a larger thing that I've been thinking about. Um, I, I actually think that um, blame can, can, really, uh, can really go awry in a lot of cases, actually. Yeah. But I didn't bring that up here because I was trying to make like the most, <laughs> like, like least controversial point, but. Hi, um, so I'm wondering just about something that you said about um, blame not being a useful framework when we're thinking about our relationship to ourselves mm -hmm. or yeah, within our relationship to ourselves. Um, 
And I was wondering, because it would seem to me that there are certain relationships that we can hold to ourselves, that if they're not blameworthy, they are not useful to mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how you might conceptualize a way to talk about those relationships that are potentially not only harmful to ourselves, but harmful to others. Um, as you gave the example of a child, right. like imitating harmful roles, but it would seem to me that there are even sort of, yeah, relationships we can hold to ourselves that are harmful to our own experience, which in turn mm -hmm. like harm the experience of others. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you think that there's like a word, a concept that can indicate that, that wouldn't necessarily assign blame, but would assign some kind of unhelpfulness. Yeah. If that makes sense. It does make sense. Um, yeah, I actually struggled in writing that section with knowing what words to use. I mean, I, my, my sense is like that the blame is not the right, is not the right approach to that. And that, that seems maybe really obvious in cases. The kind, I mean, I, I tried to choose cases that, for that um, to be really obvious, like, you know, excessive negative self-critique or something. Blaming just seems not only unhelpful, but actually just adding to the problem. But I was also trying to say that those, that doesn't make those things like fine. <laughs> I mean, I think that, that they're pretty problematic. The, I think that there's a couple issues here. One issue has to do with um, how we understand what makes something wrong. I mean, you can, you can follow kind of like Mill, you know, John Stuart Mill um, on this and be like, well, morality is really about what happens to other people. Um, but then your kind of case complicates that because you're just basically thinking of cases where it's actually an attitude you have to yourself that influences or affects how we treat other people or what happens in our relationships with other people. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I honestly, I think I use like morally problematic, which is, you know, oh. <laughs> because I, I didn't, I don't know. I, I, do you have an idea, Jeff? If, if you're thinking with Vasubandhu, yeah. then I would be thinking of kushala, akushala, yeah, right. and wholesome, just say un, yeah. unwholesome or unhealthy versus yeah. healthy. Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. I want to throw myself on the queue for a minute. Um, <laughs> As you were talking, I was thinking a lot about Cynthia Townley's book mm -hmm. on ignorance, where she talks a lot about what we might call culpable knowledge. Yeah, right. right? Stuff that you just don't have any business knowing, uh -huh. or that it's just stupid to know, mm -hmm. right? So if, if I, I mean, some of the stuff that I might not have any business knowing, mm -hmm. right, are, you know, the contents of the drawers in, you know, your house, right? right? <laughs> um, even if I didn't have to go in there, if I just had drones go in there and right. let me know and it didn't bother you, I've got no business knowing that and there's a problem if I know that, right? right, right. Um, but there's also the other kind of example she considers is somebody who devotes their life to memorizing the New York City phone book, right? right? right. Um, <laughs> it's just not the stuff you want to know. Yeah. And um, what I was wondering was, is there a dimension of ignorance, paradoxically, behind mm -hmm. culpable knowledge? Yeah. That's a really, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I think that there is um, in the sense that, I mean, I think this comes up maybe more clearly in like Vasubandhu's view because like, like all the Buddhists, I mean, he's going to, he says that the, the object, like the kind of moral knowledge or the kind of knowledge, I guess you could say in question is knowledge of, of okay, if you, if you are a Buddhist scholar kind of person, knowledge of no self, karma, dependent origination and the Four Noble Truths. If you're not a Buddhist person, that basically translates to knowledge of the nature of identity, knowledge of relationality and dependence, and knowledge of the nature of suffering and happiness, how it's caused and what it is and what we do about it. Um, so, yeah, so I mean, there seems like if you're, if you're off on some, you know, project to, to memorize the New York City phone book, um, well, you're kind of misprioritizing, and that seems like kind of a... a um, an ignorance function. Um, and you might also, there's a question is like, why? Why are you doing that? I mean, I think that's a really important question. I mean, we can, that's a, that's a case where, you know, we might think, oh, who would do that? But of course, we distract ourselves with knowledge all the time. Like, I know every word to every song on this album I didn't even really like, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, you know, I know every character in this Netflix series. Um, yeah, I guess we could also ask, well, well, why, why is our attention focused so much over there and not, 
not somewhere else? Like, what are, what are we getting from that? Um, and yeah, so yeah, I think culpable knowledge, especially on a Buddhist view, would have a lot to do with ignorance. Yeah. Please join me in thanking Emily, and we'll see you tomorrow at Philosophy Over Pizza. Thank you.